Thank you, Ronan, and thank you all for having me today. Uh, I wish I could be there in person and perform for you all live. It is a different experience live, but hopefully you got a taste of a little bit of what I do. Um, basically, my passion is about, in, a, in essence, creating a, a new culture, a culture of the future, and imagining what does that look like, does that feel like, how can we foster that? Um, and so with, with Bella Gaia, it's, it's really almost like a new kind of uh, ritual where we explore the world in a, as, it, as it exists holistically, as, as astronauts see it with, you know, um, from outer space, this borderless world, uh, this living bubble of life in the blackness of space and uh, delivering that, that Earthrise moment that was, that was very popularized in with the Apollo missions, but bringing that into a, a direct experience, an immersive experience that you and I can both feel what it feels like to be an astronaut actually seeing the Earth from space. And uh, Bella Gaia has been seen and experienced by about seven astronauts now who have been to space and seven of them have vouched for the realness of the feeling that they had when they were in space that Bella Gaia was able to replicate. Um, so there's something here about uh, emotional engagement um, that is beyond words. Bella Gaia has very few words or narration in the show. It's mainly music and uh, visuals and a lot of data visualizations. So there is actually a lot of information that is communicated through data visualizations and, and very sophisticated and beautiful computer simulations that NASA creates. But it's delivered in this sort of artistic context um, that is engaging not just the left brain, but also the right brain, the whole brain. That in my mind is really how uh, humans um, receive and learn. And this is not just myself, this is backed up by the latest neuroscience. And um, working with Ronan, uh, we've written many uh, proposals for, for funding and I think you mentioned the, the NASA grant, um, education grant that we won that was an affirmation of, of the importance of art in communicating science. And we, we did a four to five year education program, really uh, proving how this emotional experience is really the front door to education uh, in earth science. So I guess in envisioning the future, um, you know, I, I, Ronan and I have both had very personal passions in the realm of um, intangible cultural heritage, like rituals um, uh, in, in indigenous cultures and in, in traditional cultures around the world. And what fascinates me is how intangible cultural heritage, things like dance, music, art, uh, is really a cohesive glue that holds cultures together. And so if you were to re uh, reverse engineer a future culture, well then what does the intangible cult cultural heritage of a future culture look like? And obviously that future culture will, will need to be uh, sustainable, a sustainable culture. It's a culture that uh, is um, as equal as it can be is uh, living in harmony with, with the natural world um, on a path to a sustainable future. Um, so I've, I've been very passionate about uh, sort of painting that picture of what we want for the future. And I, I believe that is in many ways the role of the artist is to envision the future, to visualize what we want. Otherwise, we can never get there. Uh, so really having a, a, not just a visual, but a feeling 
about where we want to go, I think is, is crucial. Now, it's definitely not the most popular thing or um, uh, profitable thing to do, but um, this is the sort of path that I'm on that I have uh, found success in. And um, what I'm developing right now that's very interesting is with the University of Colorado at Boulder. They uh, invited me to be an artist in residence this year, and I proposed a new kind of um, 3D visualization uh, live performance uh, project called Origin Stories. And this is eventually to be plugged in. You may need to have him turn off his video. Do we turn off our video already? Let's turn off our video. Hey. Hi. Hello. Hey. Sorry, we dropped the video drop for a second there. He's back. Okay, you're back. Sorry, it was right at Boulder. Is that talking about the artist in residence at Boulder, the 3D. Okay. Uh, so I was uh, invited as an artist in residence in Boulder, and we worked on this new kind of projection technique that is an interactive visuals with dancers. And um, we developed this sort of augmented reality 3D hologram floating visuals that appear to be floating in front of the dancer uh, and the dancer can interact with these visuals to help tell the story. Um, this is something I've wanted to do for very long and the university uh, sponsored this production and R&D and we presented it at the Conference on World Affairs in April and also in New York City past spring and um, it was very successful and they've invited me back uh, not only to expand the origin stories production to four dancers and uh, a more sophisticated visual uh, artistry but also to begin the process of I guess exploring ways to develop an interdisciplinary uh, curriculum at the university for undergraduate and graduate students, essentially based on the methodology of Belagaya, which is bringing science and art together. Uh, and this is what um, I've I've brought in Ronan again, um, since it's very much in line with our passions, but also our past projects with NASA uh, to really scale this Belagaya methodology um, into academia and into education to have disparate uh, studies work together and collaborate. So for example, having uh, a science student provide a data set and have pair them with a dance student and uh, they have to work together to express a certain data set through live performance or through uh, data visualization uh, to communicate it in a, in a more engaging way. Um, so this is, a, I don't know, it's a very exciting um, prospect. There's a lot ahead of us, but uh, Ronan, maybe you can, um, you can share some of your ideas regarding that. Great, yeah, I'd love to. So, um, you know, Kenji and I met over, about a little over 20 years ago, and he was a student at Boulder studying film, and I was uh, studying philosophy and religion at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And, uh, you know, my interest here is this sense that, um, uh, you know, the, the, I heard a quote, someone was paraphrasing William Blake. He said, if the truth could be told so as to be understood, it would be believed. Uh, 
and I think that's in some way what we're trying to do. And truth, that's a whole nother, you know, philosophical can of worms to open up there. But I think if we, if we could truly, you know, understand, and, and, and I think this is, this, is, this is from immersive multi-sensory sort of, uh, we're trying to get to the, I uh, got it, the aha moment. And we recognize, uh, I call this sometimes an um, integral consilience and sense around. I know that's quite a, quite a term there, but a sense that this coming together of knowledge and, and wisdom, this, this is the piece that I think we're, you know, we running into challenges working in academia, but have found out that the emotional component uh, is something that seems to tap into the wisdom aspect of, you know, the, the knowledge system. And that's something uh, in the, both visually and musically and learning how to do it in ways that accurately portray scientific information and not to uh, misportray it or other types of information, but to touch the heart to bring mind and knowledge and wisdom together. Does that seem like a fair characterization, Kenji? Yes, I mean, you mentioned uh, sense around, you know, this is finally the age of virtual, re virtual reality, augmented reality, um, and I have uh, dabbled a little bit in virtual reality. There's actually a virtual reality version of Bella Gaia that is for free. You can download it off our website if you have one of these um, Oculus Gear VRs with a Samsung phone. And it's a five minute um, VR experience that is in, you're in a complete 360 degree sphere reality, completely separate. You're basically floating in outer space as if you're an astronaut. And um, I, I just think that they're all, they're, there's obviously with any technology, huge potential, but also caveats um, with virtual reality. But um, for me, for Bella Gaia, this has been the most ultimate uh, pitch tool in that it has finally been able to communicate what Bella Gaia feels like without explaining it in words. And in many ways, that's been the challenge of explaining what is Bella Gaia is because it can't be explained in words no matter how many uh, documents or photos I show or even a YouTube video, it, it somewhat gets you there, but it really highlights the importance of context in that the live experience, the immersion is something you can't really replicate unless you're there. So the VR thing has definitely gotten much closer um, and I invite every, any, anyone to, to try it for free, download it from our website. Um, but then also what's what I think is going to be bigger than virtual reality is augmented reality uh, in that you're not fully removed from this real world space because you can see um, these sort of holograms floating in your real space, but they're obviously tracked in relation to the real physical world. But this to me is very interesting because you can really have groups of people having communal uh, group experiences that are shared and that brings in the human and the social um, component that is so so much more valuable than being completely in a virtual world uh, but it, it has a lot of potential for education but for also creating group spiritual experiences transcendental experiences um, I've, I've tried this HoloLens by Microsoft and it, it, I think it really has the potential to create new modes of transportation, if you will. Um, but given the right, you know, curation and direction and creative uh, direction, of course. But it's, it's a fascinating world. Um, that uh, is, I'm very excited to contributing a little little piece uh, to it. 
Great. I'll just say the last couple of words and we'll take some questions. Uh, you know, neither Kenji and I are techno utopianists, you know, thinking that just everything can be fixed by technology. And really our original connection really came through earth interests, was, that, was through dancing and indigenous ways. Uh, and I remember one of the first times when we were connecting as friends, we went backpacking in the Rocky Mountains. I don't know if you remember that, Kenji, we went way, way out uh, uh, far and a uh, very high elevation. And so, we're, you know, we're rooted in the deep one. Don't think that, you know, just bells and whistles, that was just going to make some magic, you know, a poof all be wonderful. But we want to bring the majesty of the earth, the beautiful earth, the Bella Gaia, and bring it through. We have these tools, and it's better that we work with them and try to bring the, the uh, spirit of creativity and love and goodness rather than just cede it to those that are going to use it anyway. And uh, we we'll see what little bit that we can do. So maybe now would be a time that would, uh, to take a couple questions from the audience uh, if you like to. Anybody? Zach? I just wonder if Kenji could uh, elaborate a little bit more on the use of visual media technology for human spiritual development. Uh, I'm familiar with some communities in the Buddhist community that are using that uh, as a way for contemplative practice, but I'm curious to hear your experience and also where you see the potential lying in your work. Okay, I, I need that repeated. I couldn't hear I'll repeat that for you. Zach's asking uh, how, in uh, aside from sort of the, the work you're doing in the public art sphere, uh, what do you think the potential of, the, of this kind of immersive digital media for spiritual contemplative practices and inner inner growth? Or if you if you know people working in that or have any thoughts or experiences related to that, I have, um, you know a couple of friends who are working in this uh, world of uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, some of them are very interested in using this for almost uh, psychology therapy. Um, I'm not a psychologist or a therapist, but it, it can create, um, it can amplify some of the existing therapies of, for example, projecting your ego um, or projecting your your future self that you want to be, but in in a literal physical form in front of you. Um, that's not in a virtual space, but it's actually sitting there in the room with you, and you can converse with yourself, uh, your future self, or the self that you want to get rid of, or whatever it be. I think there's a lot of a lot of potential in that world in terms of self um, improvement. Um, but then if you can think of scaling that to a group and then a larger networked um, communities and in many ways, you know, visualizing the, the future that we want in our physical world, it's not, it's not separated in this virtual reality world, but we can sort of superimpose our future visions on our existing world, perhaps that can help us, motivate us in feeling that it is attainable. Because I think that's, that's part of the paralysis that we're in right now is there's so much cynicism, there's so much uh, hopelessness and giving up or that it just seems so unattainable that I think there may be this potential for augmented reality and technology to assist us in, in being able to see that vision, to, to see that potential and that to close the gap, um, to really melt away some of the paralysis that we're in right now, especially like with climate change, but also, you know, boiling that down to the micro, the, the micro level, in your daily life, for example. Um, I mean, in terms of spiritual experiences, when I tried this HoloLens, it, it was like a psychedelic experience. <laughs> there are things crawling on the walls, 
mapped directly to the wall. Um, you know, call it a, a bad trip or a good trip. Uh, it was incredibly realistic. Great, and just, just to help explain again to the difference between virtual reality, I'll explain this between virtual reality and augmented reality. If you had virtual reality, you have a thing on your face and you're immersed in this. Augmented reality is essentially Star Trek, practically. You don't get beamed up, but it's practically Star Trek. These holograms just appear. You have glasses on and these holograms appear in front of your, your face. And so it, it could be hallucinatory and potentially psychotic experience uh, when Kenji told me about the thing crawling out of the walls, uh, it you know, and and I I think one of these things which makes our work even more important is this could be uh, a nightmare. A, a friend of mine called it pathogenic ontology in cyberspace. <laughs> he, Mark Pesci he described he described that in 1993 in technical detail. He was a pioneer in early virtual reality and created something called. VRML, which was an early online 3D. He made some contributions to that and he really mapped out this could be pathological. Um, and I think it's all the more reason for us to show the ways in that it could be, uh, you know, let's go for the beatific vision and not, uh, you know, psychotic nightmares. I mean, there's plenty of them that we've already got. And, um, so yeah, that's what we're, we're uh, you know, working towards. Yes, over here. What generates the specific imagery or things that you see? Is it pre-programmed as part of the uh, uh, augmented reality sort of thing that you see? Yeah. Or is it, is it, is it uh, reacting to what's going on in your mind or reacting to your sensory? Yeah, Ken, Kenji says so she's asking, like, how exactly do you see what is it? Does it come in the package? Do you interact with something in real time? And how does it actually work like that? Uh, so the HoloLens, I mean, augmented reality is a pretty broad term. I think everyone heard the term first this year when Pokemon Go got really um, big. And that's essentially your phone. Uh, you sort of, you know, scan it across your world and you see things bouncing around in your world. Um, it's the same kind of concept, but with HoloLens uh, and other companies like Meta, I mean, there's a huge universe opening up of different companies making their own versions, but it's basically glasses, clear glass uh, in front of your eyes like you're wearing glasses, but just imagine images being um, reflected on the glass in your field of vision where it's uh, projecting sort of floating things um, or mapping your, your room uh, walls and objects or you, you, know, you can place a virtual object on your desk. It's there in your, in your vision, it's not physically there, um, but it's, it's the accuracy of the tracking of your head, uh, the tracking of your physical position in the room, which I was surprised at how accurate that was. I mean, one of, one of the out-of-the-box programs of the HoloLens was this three-dimensional galaxy um, rotating in space. And I could walk around the galaxy, peer underneath it, peer over it, uh, it was incredibly real. It was floating in the middle of my room. So that's, that's the sort of um, holographic floating image effect that, that it can produce. So yes, yeah, so there is a combination of pre -pro you know, certain amounts of pre-programming and then certain things that happen in real time. In the program, but then it maps onto the yeah. picture. And yeah. yeah, and so there's a lot of room of, uh, for educators, for conscious programmers, for people to work together to create curricula and packages and ways and guidance tour. And uh, there are some other techniques, I think they'll come about visualizing databases that I think will become more. So some things, will, there's a certain database that, that it's working off of, and then you, get, you can go explore it um, but all these things so there are different pieces of it and some of it requires some pre-programming but 
really the key is, is like, what do we do with these incredible powers? And they've already got, you know, to design motorcycles and, you know, that's fine. Uh, but there's also, I'm sure they've already designed, I'm sure, bombs and aircraft carriers. And so th there is a big, and some of the ways that things evolve does, I think, r relate to choices in that we make of how to do it. And, and there are real learning curves here and access. This isn't readily accessible and there are digital divide, real digital divide type issues. And uh, but I think what, what artists here, you know, and creatives pushing the boundary of what could be uh, is I think what's so important about the work that Kenji does. And I try to come and help work on that of how that can translate into education and how does it relate to scholarship. Uh, but it's such an important of trying to help us show, look, we could do this. Uh, and I think that's really valuable. Uh, maybe last question here. Uh, yeah, I was um, gonna ask, has Bella Gaia or does Bella Gaia intend to provide visual expression to um, wide scale planetary degradation, whether it's desertification or a uh, glacial melt? Um, I think it would be a really pop empowering tool to look at. I'm just curious. Yeah, he, he was just asking how much do you do of, you know, like planetary visualization, desertification, climate change. We only saw like, you know, a few minutes. So maybe you can tell them what you do in that right. area. Yeah. Uh, that is a, uh, an entire section and chapter of the show called the Anthropocene uh, that is a lot of... Um, contributed content curated by NASA and their data visualization studios at NASA Goddard, where they have a studio dedicated to visualizing most of the data that comes from their Earth uh, orbiting satellites. So it, it, it includes things like um, fires in the Amazon that uh, are actually updated every, I think it's every day or every week that that you can, that I have this program that can download the latest data of fire activity anywhere on Earth, um, and it is shocking to see that the fires raging in the Amazon and in Africa, um, especially at certain times of year. And then things like uh, time lapse from space, which is an incredibly visually rich uh, form of communication. Things. Like like the Arctic ice uh, growing and receding, but you know, receding over time, or um, visualizations like growing cities over since the 70s, they've been taking Landsat imagery. You can see cities like Las Vegas just ballooning or cities like Dubai expanding, creating their own islands um, on the ocean. Uh, and then visualizing all sorts of human activities like um, the tens of thousands of airplanes in the air at any one moment, even right now, that are flying in the air. It's pretty mind boggling to see uh, every plane visualized as a, as a dot on the earth. Um, and all the ships that are transporting our goods all around the world. I mean, th these sort of visualizations are really shocking to see. That's just visualizing real data. Um, and that's, I think, what, what makes this particular project as an artist so meaningful to me is that it's not just pretty pictures, it's actually real data, real science. Uh, it's not just pretty computer graphics. And so it's like an MRI of the entire planet and all human and natural activity, the connection between human activity and our ecosystem is undeniable. But I don't say that explicitly. I, I just show the data and let the audience come to their own conclusions. And ultimately that I think is the most powerful way to communicate. And I, I've had climate skeptics converted in one show um, and the, the, the survey evaluation data from our from our uh, NASA education program with Ronan 
um, has been equally pretty, pretty amazingly effective. Um, and so we proving that this methodology works.